tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we're speaking with Anna Rains. Anna has been involved in animal welfare in its various forms for about 10 years. She was introduced to human-wildlife conflict during a semester abroad in northern Tanzania, where she studied conflict on the borders of national parks. When she returned, she began her professional career in animal welfare as a wildlife rehabilitator at a large facility outside of Atlanta, supervising the rehabilitation and release of over 2,000 wild animals per year. This is also where she was introduced to the concept of complaint mitigation and the importance of spreading the messaging of coexistence. After leaving the wild and wonderful world of wildlife rehabilitation, she worked as an animal control officer in Metro Atlanta, primarily working in the underserved communities of inner city Atlanta. She found herself back on the front line of mitigating animal-related complaints. This is also where she was introduced to the concept of TNR and community cat programming. She saw a huge area of need within the community, and when the opportunity to manage the Best Friends Community Cat Program in Cobb County became available, she jumped right on it. The CCP in Cobb County brought the save rate for cats from a 62% save rate to a 94% save rate for cats, a difference of about 1,000 cats. While they fully transitioned operation of the program to a partner organization, They are still working hard on a grassroots effort to change the local ordinances to officially allow for TNR and return to field. When she's not entirely engulfed in the world of animal welfare, she spends her time on working on her small family farm with her husband, three-year-old son, three dogs, barn cats, and chickens. And I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thanks for having me, Stacey. Well, so uh, congratulations on all the animal work you've done. Thank you for caring so much for all the wild animals as well as now the community cats. So really, really appreciate that. There's a lot in your bio that really shared with us, you know, why you became so involved. But what was the first thing that made you passionate about cats? So believe it or not, I came about it from a very strange way. When I was working as a wildlife rehabilitator, I was being fed a very different narrative on outdoor cats, and I was as vehemently opposed to TNR and cats being outside and returned to field as one could be. I just, having animals coming in that were caught by cat and orphaned or injured by outdoor cats, you know, it was something that I wasn't going to change my mind on. And then when I left wildlife rehab and began working as an animal control officer, I saw what was really going on and I learned more about community cat programming and TNR and the whole goal behind it and just became so, so passionate about it and realized that this is the best way to help wildlife. If you want to protect wildlife, if you want to protect birds, then you need to do a full dive into TNR and cat programming because we all, you know, we all want the same thing. We all want less cats outdoors. So were you introduced to that from a particular organization or an individual person, or did you volunteer for a group? I mean, how did you first learn about TNR? Yeah. So I worked for an organization called Lifeline Animal Project. They manage the animal control for Fulton and DeKalb counties. And I was an ACO at Fulton County Animal Services. So Lifeline, the nonprofit, actually held the contract for the field services there. And they are very forward thinking, were forward thinking when when I was working there and had a not a full scale CCP, but they were very focused on intake diversion of cats and TNR and complaint mitigation. So as an officer, I got a a very quick lesson in complaint mitigation, which I, you know, it's the same conversations that you have as a wildlife rehabilitator with people about wildlife and just trying to solve the complaint in a way that protects the animals and helps the person out in the end. So I actually had the pleasure of visiting Lifeline's brand new shelter and surgical suite when we were down in Atlanta last October. So Lifeline is a huge organization now. Yeah, Lifeline, Rebecca Gwynn is the CEO and founder, and it is 
ever expanding. I think she's going to stick with the two counties that she has now, but they did just build a massive new, they call it the Lifeline Community Center. And they have low cost vet care available to residents everywhere in Metro. And it's a really large facility that they're able to do adoptions out of. And they can actually pull animals from the municipality. So they're pulling dogs and cats from Fulton's shelter and from DeKalb's county shelters to be adopted out of this beautiful new facility. So, you know, we've gone through several months with this whole coronavirus, COVID-19 thing. How has spay-neuter services been in the Atlanta area? Have things really slowed down or have the uh, spay-neuter clinics been able to run through much of this, this terrible time? Yeah, it was a, you know, it's a huge concern with it being right in the midst of the beginnings of kitten season. So TNR surgeries and the spay neuter providers in Atlanta did slow down for probably about a month, I would say, throughout March and are just now picking back up on surgeries and offering TNR to the public again. So hopefully it wasn't too much of a gap that we won't be flooded with kittens. So we've been fortunate that they've been able to start providing surgeries again rather quickly. Yep. And for our listeners, we are recording this at the end of May. So it's just to give you a little bit of a sense of time and place. We're still in the middle of things, but it even now it seems like the clinics are opened up and pretty much functioning at a good clip in Atlanta and the Georgia area. And that's all great news for kitten season. And I want to ask you a question. So you've, you've got the opportunity to be in charge of a community cat program. So I guess I get to call you a community cat program manager. You know, what does that mean to you? And, you know, who would be a really good community cat program manager? Is it a specific personality type? I would say it definitely is a specific personality type. I really fell in love with the role. For some reason, I guess I love getting yelled at about animal issues. But I think someone who just being really patient and able to have really hard conversations with people about really emotional issues it is an important, important part of the job. The complaint mitigation factor, I'm so passionate about it because I think that it is one of the most important things surrounding TNR and community cats and just keeping an open conversation for all sides of the spectrum to talk about. And hopefully one day can work on relationships with wildlife groups. That's really going to be my goal. So you have as a hot topic is the whole bird cat predation thing. That's like your passion. Yeah, I'm really interested in that because it seems to be an ever-growing conversation. You know, as the facts, we have so much evidence and the science is really supporting the fact that TNR works. Our opponents, you know, are kind of narrowing down to a smaller, maybe more targeted argument. And it seems to be, just in my experience, I'm seeing a lot more wildlife conflict concerns. And how is that demonstrated just through the press in general, or are there any further studies? I mean, a lot of the studies that I have seen with regards to cats and determining the number of birds that cats kill, that information to me seems a little bit out of date. I've never seen anything within the last 10 years where TNR and return to field have become really much more popular and sort of standard protocol in many areas. Have you seen anything that has come out? And I understand maybe we need to have that conversation with Peter Wolf, who has been a guest on the podcast before, or someone like that. But I just feel like that conversation, it would be helpful to have, I guess, more current information. And I didn't know if you'd seen any more references to anything specific other than to say, you know, there was a dead bird in my backyard and my cat's sitting right next to it. Therefore, my cat killed the bird when the bird could have hit the window of the house, and that's what killed the bird. Providing a safe and nurturing environment is every cat caregiver's top priority. The American Association of Feline Practitioners understands your cat's natural behaviors and aims to supply you with tips and resources to help you provide the very best care for your cat. Join our cat community by visiting catfriendly.com, and you can sign up for our newsletter. This website was designed to be a place where cat caregivers can receive credible and trustworthy information from veterinarians on a variety of topics just for cats. Learn ways to understand your cat's unique characteristics and behaviors, how to keep your cat healthy, and the importance of routine veterinary care. Did you know that August 22nd is National Take Your Cat to the Vet Day? 
Make sure you visit catfriendly.com to find out why it is important to take your cat to the veterinarian for his or her annual checkup. Get tips on how to make it a less stressful experience for you and your cat. You can also search for a cat-friendly practice near you. Don't wait. Visit catfriendly.com today. Say goodbye to scooping. Say hello to a better litter box. Introducing Kitty Sift, the eco-friendly, waterproof litter box made of recycled cardboard. Just lift, sift, and reuse. See it on Amazon or go to kittysift.com and use coupon code PODCAST for 15% off. Do you struggle to find foster homes for your animals? Are you struggling to communicate with your fosters and keep track of what they need? Introducing Foster Space, powered by Dubert, where recruiting and communicating with your fosters just got a whole lot easier. Need a new foster for an animal? Simply create the foster request in Dubert and it will automatically send it to existing Duberteers and also post on your Facebook pages and groups. Need to communicate with your fosters? No problem. Dubert makes it easy to communicate via text with individual fosters or to get messages out to your different groups of fosters. Your fosters can even put in help desk style tickets for questions or supplies they need and the Dubert system will help you keep track and stay organized. Check out Foster Space by signing in on your Dubert account today at www.dubert.com. Yeah, I haven't seen any new any new studies or data. And the thing about that kind of data, it's nearly impossible to have accurate numbers. Like you're saying, a lot of it's just personal experiences. And we don't really even know the number of community cats out in outdoors in the United States. We don't have a exact number of the number of birds in the United States. And a lot of this activity is not happening before our eyes, you know, so there's not really a good way to track it. And a lot of the the past studies have not been super scientifically reliable because of those facts. But yeah, just remembering that just because we, you know, maybe a cat is dropping a bird at our door does not mean that cats everywhere are preying on birds and other wildlife. It undoubtedly does happen, but it's really easy to blow it out of proportion when you're relying on subjective data. When I've had conversations with wildlife or bird organizations and I get in the room with them sitting around the table, I use the simple math argument, which is if you had a choice of having 100 cats outside versus 10 cats outside, which would you choose? And in every case, the bird folks all say, I'd rather have 10 cats than 100 cats. And I say, me too. I'm on that page. I'm with you. So this is how we get there. This is how we do it. And there's a level of understanding that there are some cats, not all, but there are some cats that are left to fend on their own outside, you know, because of certain situations and and that kind of thing. But through the programs that we put in place, we can ensure that the population of outdoor cats will go down. The number of cats out there will go down with aggressive spay neuter. You cannot tell me otherwise. And I think that if we can just get them to agreeing to that and to understand that we're not creating a situation that causes more issues, we're actually preventing a potential situation that would cause more issues. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And to further your point, if you have a, a robust community cat program that is open and available to your community and your field services and TNR groups are able to support community cat caregivers, you're going to have less cats that are unsupported if caregivers are free to feed, if ordinances are supporting them and allowing for proper colony management. You're also going to see cats that are full are not going to be hunting. Right. And also the other thing too is if there was an organization in that area currently supporting free roaming cat colonies, like you said, with feeders and that kind of thing, and they became disheartened and left the area because they didn't want to be involved in whatever action that the wildlife organization was suggesting. If they left that area, I was able to say, you know, last year I had X number of strays brought in from that area and 90% of them were not spayed or neutered. And they were brought in due to the monitoring of this group and understanding, you know, what was 
a newcomer, an unidentified newcomer, very intensely involved with the community, knows the neighbors. The neighbors are very intense. It's a very tightly managed ecosystem. And if I could say that, and I said, if you make this group isolated or, you know, disenfranchised, they leave, they don't have any participation, then you're going to have another 100 cats or whatever unsterilized in this area. And then that's just going to increase and increase and increase. And once that was said, too, the organization was like, oh, well, no, we don't want that. We don't want more cats. We want no cats, but no cats becomes unrealistic. So right. there's this compromise that has to happen. And hopefully, many of these organizations are kind of coming to that idea and that understanding because we are reducing the number of cats, that sort of feline footprint that's out there we are reducing it with return to field as well as trap new to return. We just have to frame our argument in a way that makes sense to them. Right. Totally agreed. And I think it's also the conversation always seems to come back in my experience to a question of ownership, which I think should be reexamined as well, because a lot of, a lot of the people that I know in the wildlife rehab world, their argument is cats should not be outside. People need to stop letting their cats outside. But what's not being understood so much in that realm is that these cats have been there forever, <laughs> for a long, long time. You know, people aren't going out and the vast majority of community cats aren't cats that people went out and purchased or adopted and then put outside. These cats are part of the ecosystem and we have the responsibility to try to manage it in a way that is humane and works. Yeah, but I'll add to that and also say that a lot of those cats that are out there, some of them are obviously spayed and neutered, but there's also a large number of them that aren't. And I think that if we can ensure that we're getting as much of that outdoor population spayed or neutered, then there's a lot of encouragement for the community to bring them indoors. Because I don't know about you, but I don't want to live with an unneutered cat and I do not want to live with a cat in heat in my house. So if we can ensure as much, I mean, that's why I think actually, you know, the organizations that support wildlife and birds and that kind of thing, they should give us money to spay and neuter these cats because that's the first step to getting those cats indoors. If they're not sterilized, not many people are going to want to house them. So I think the best thing we can do is just work as hard as possible to get as many of those cats spayed or neutered. And that will resolve a lot of problems without even addressing it. Just because mother nature will then, the community will be like, oh, wonderful. This cat's already spayed and neutered. It's ear tip. You know, I'm educated. I know that the cat's got rabies vaccine behind it too. Therefore, hey, you know, I'll take you back in, honey, or I'll, you know, I'll have you in more in the house because you're not spraying on my radiators anymore. You know, so, you know, I think that those are some simple solutions that will just help resolve a conflict without even addressing it human to human. It's just a simple solution. And if we just join together to support it in the full belief that, you know, any cat out there with four paws on the pavement needs to be spayed or neutered. And then I think life will be really pretty good. So You're right. <laughs> I convinced <laughs> one <day>. you. <laughs> I convinced you. So I've got one off the list. It's uh, the soapbox is just so easy to jump right up on. So I uh, appreciate you letting me uh, jump on it. But you have talked about some ordinances in Cobb County that you've been working on. What are you working on there? Yeah. So before all of this COVID mess, we were pushing really hard to get the ordinances updated for Cobb County. So we operated the community cat program starting in 2016. We just passed it off to a partner organization, Good Muse Animal Foundation, in January of this year. So we've been operating the program for quite some time successfully and never quite got around to getting the ordinances changed to support the program and technically to allow for it. You know, we've had a lot of pushback, some leadership, and have kind of been going about it a backdoor way and really focusing on a grassroots effort to engage the community and engage local rescue groups and TNR groups. And we had a couple meetings before the pandemic hit us with the commissioners, and we had tons of people show up in support. So hopefully once things get back to normal, we'll continue the fight to get the ordinances updated. So currently there is still a leash law in Cobb County. And so we're looking to remove the leash law for cats, for cats that is, sorry, keep dogs on leashes. <laughs> There's still a leash law for cats in Cobb County. We're working with our legislative team right now to figure out exactly the easiest way 
to get the ordinances to allow for the program without, you know, making it too convoluted or confusing. Wow. I can't believe leash laws for cats. That just does not compute at all in my mind. But- <laughs> yeah. So it's always been a, a point of contention for the program because the local animal control doesn't feel comfortable getting fully involved in the program. They don't feel comfortable having their officers RTF cats, and they also don't feel comfortable turning away all stray cats, including cats in traps, including ear-tipped cats, because they feel bound to the ordinances. So I think once we can get the ordinances updated to where they should be, the program you know, will be able to run much more smoothly and in a much more integrated way. Anna, if folks are interested in finding more information about the work that you're doing, how would they do that? Well, feel free to reach out to me. You can reach out to me directly at Anna R. So it's A-N-N-A-R at bestfriends.org. You can check us out online, bestfriends.org. We actually have a great, under the resources tab, we have a great amount of information. Our community cat program handbook has the answers to every question you could ever have about cat programming. And follow us on our social media pages. Lots of cute kittens and puppy pictures. (laughs) And is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Just thank you for listening. Thank you for being involved in the movement. You know, this work can be very emotionally and physically exhausting, as we all know. And sometimes it can feel thankless when you're just getting yelled at and the cats are yelling at you and the people are yelling at you. But just, I just want to remind everyone that it's so important and thank you for being involved and try to get your neighbors involved. Talk to your neighbors, spread the word and get people you know involved in TNR because, you know, we're only going to be able to be successful in this if we work together. So share it with your community. That's great. And I want to thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest on my show. And I hope we'll have you on again in the future. Absolutely. Anytime. Thanks for having me. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think. And a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening, and thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats. Bye.